want to welcome everyone today to our workshop. Today's event is sponsored by the Office of Graduate and Professional Studies at American University. At American University, we are committed to pursuing inclusive excellence. One of our practices shared from our indigenous and native communities is to offer a land acknowledgement at the beginning of our meetings and events. The goal is to build our mindfulness of the historical processes in which we still participate. American University is founded on the unceded land of the Nacostonk and Acostan and Piscataway peoples. I ask you to join me in acknowledging these communities, their elders, both past and present, as well as future generations. American University also acknowledges that it was founded upon exclusions and erasures of many indigenous peoples, including those on whose land this institution is located. With this acknowledgement, we commit to working to dismantle the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism. Those of you who attend our events know that we always provide a land acknowledgement. I would encourage you to take this a step further today and do some research on the land where you are. I am putting um, some information in the chat. If you want to look up, you can um, check where the, the land where you are sitting. You can do that either online or through the number that I have put in the chat. Thanks very much for joining us. I'm going to send it over to Jessica. Thanks, Bev. Appreciate it. Hey, everybody. I am I am Jessica Bancroft. She, her pronouns. Um, most of you in the room know that I am uh, the associate director of the professional programs. And so I act as many, many things, including an advisor to the students. And I work closely with our faculty that we have here today. Matt Winkler, who's with our sports faculty or sports <laughs> sports analytics management program, and uh, Dr. Robert Stokes, who is with the Human Resource Analytics Management Program. And um, it's great to have you all here. We're excited. I am super excited um, to introduce a friend of mine who I think we've been friends since we were in seventh or eighth grade, mm -hmm. um, Hope Wallop. I did it there. I did it. Oh, <laughs> Hope, <laughs> maiden name Wallace, nay Wallace, Timberlake. And, um, um, you know, I thought of bringing hope in when um, there were other conversations around um, data visualization and then the reports that people do, et cetera. And then when Hope and I spoke, she said, you know, this is great for the big presentation, but what it's really geared towards is to get you ready all the steps of the way and to have you um, find your voice communicate clearly and be heard, um, especially in places where you might not be heard unless you can really put yourself out there. And so this seemed like a really good fit for what we do in our programs as we prepare you all to be out to be out there um, doing your analytics and then sharing um, your results. Um, Hope does have a degree from Duke um, Bachelor's of Art degree for, okay, I don't know what you got your degree in at Duke Hope, but I knew Political she also science. has, um, what was that? Political science. That's, that's okay, we're at American University, that makes sense to us. Um, and then at um, UC Berkeley, she did a master's in public health and statistics. Um, she has been consulting um, within the realm of communication, et cetera, for quite some time. Uh, you all got her bio to begin with, and I am going to give her the opportunity to introduce herself a little bit more as we jump into this, but um, a heartfelt thank you to all of you who are here today, and um, hope I'm going to turn it over to you, and thank you for being here. Great. Thank you, Jessica and Bev, and all of you for being here. So appreciate it. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, which will you will be able to get this information later, but so you can actually see my name as well. It's Hope Timberlake, as, as you know. I live in California. I am a speaker, trainer, coach, and an author, and focused on persuasive communication, particularly in everyday situations. I spent a while, uh, a good chunk of my career focused on big high stakes conferences and helping prepare speakers to connect with audiences with their very technical uh, content, 
But what I realized is the majority of our time, we are communicating, persuading, explaining day-to-day situations in meetings and one-on-one scenarios. And that's where we want to be effective uh, because we spend more time there than we do on stages or on big uh, high stakes events. So one of the things I'd love for you to all to do is if you're open to it, if you're able to, to turn your cameras on, because this is going to be very interactive to the point that I will not call on anyone, I promise, but I would love some volunteers during it. Also, I would love to hear your questions. And the best way to do that is to put them in chat. Uh, I have a whole uh, series of things that I want to cover, but I also want to make this relevant to what your needs and your questions are. So anything that falls within the um, communicate umbrella, communication umbrella is fair game. And if for some reason we wind up not getting to all the questions, I promise to be able to get answers to you later. Uh, So feel free to, to fire away. The first thing I want to talk about is around nerve strategies. So well, let's go back a second. So I want to talk about nerve strategies because one of the things that happens is we might feel really confident in doing your data analysis and coming up with your information. As Jessica mentioned briefly, I, I did a master's degree focused in biostatistics and epidemiology. So I have spent a lot of time grinding and, and analyzing, and that can be a very solitary experience at times. And then to actually communicate or to push back or to collaborate with others uh, requires some degree of confidence and some can get, can get nerve wracking. So I'd love to hear from you in the chat, any strategies you have for overcoming nerves, whether it's a, a, in speaking up in maybe a regular weekly meeting or something higher stakes, what are some strategies you use to overcome nerves? If you can share that. And there are so many great ones. Breathing, yes, mindfulness, Erin, thank you. That's so key. Uh, on that, in that same vein, uh, sometimes if we know something's coming up and we're nervous, is visualizing success, actually getting, you know, visualizing the room, the interaction, using your senses to decide what's going to happen and how you're going to be able to handle what comes your way. A few other uh, strategies I'm going to share that may not be ones that you typically look at. A uh, power pose, yes. If you all don't know, Amy Cuddy, uh, Amy Cuddy has amazing TED Talk. It's it's you know ten years old now, but it 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 is it stands the test of time. It's great. Projection, yes. Oh, we got lots here. Um, zooming out, yes. Perspective, remembering, yes. In the scheme of the universe, is not a big deal. Exactly. So perspective, practicing, rehearsing, absolutely. I'll tell you so you're excited. Yeah, sometimes we have to say like, okay, what we're feeling, those butterflies, that nausea, the uh, all the, the quiver in the voice, that's just a, on the spectrum of excitement rather than saying, getting negative about it and saying, oh God, you know, those nerves are coming, this sucks, recognizing, yep, this is part of the process, it's exciting. So a few other things that I wanna bring up that don't always come up in this list is to get curious. It's really hard for us to be self-judgmental when we are curious about what's happening, who is going to respond, how are they going to react to the information we're sharing, how are they going to use it, what will be, what will resonate, what won't. So getting curious is a really good way of having that perspective and getting out of your own head. Next one is flipping your script. This is this idea that we have this constant script in the back of our head. And it amplifies, it's louder when we are doing something new or scary, like, oh my gosh, here I am speaking to a group of 20 plus people and are they judging me? And oh, did I misspeak? Did I use the wrong word? Does my voice sound weird? So we've got this script running in our head that is louder when we are more nervous or playing bigger. And so we want to flip that script, that script that sometimes tells us we're not enough. We don't know what we're doing. We're not experienced. We're not prepared and flip it to its opposite, to its aspirational level. So instead of saying like, I'm not experienced enough to present, or I'm a terrible, I'm a terrible presenter. It might be that if you flipped it exactly, you might flip it to like, I'm an okay presenter. We want to flip it even further to your aspirational belief of every time I present, people listen, 
or some version of where are you going with this? So it can become a mantra. You can get feel more confident about what you're doing. And when you are at that place that maybe is outside of the real range of, of what you believe, you will show the behaviors, you will sit a little taller, you will project a little bit more because you can embody what is that aspirational place you wanna be and let's show the listeners and let's show the audience, the people that we're talking to that I am there or getting close to there. The third one is silly and very mechanical, but very important. If you're on Zoom, hide your self view. This sounds so silly and I'm guessing many of you have thought about this or heard this. This is one of the most important things. When we are presenting, we're feeling a little unstable. If you're seeing yourself, all of a sudden, your self-critical thoughts go up even higher. Stanford has some really interesting research about this. It's actually very sad that when we are looking at our self-view, when we're presenting, our self-esteem plummets. Um, at best, we're distracted. If you think about when we used to go to restaurants, and if you're sitting in a booth and there, the person next to you or across from you has a mirror behind her or him or them, and you're looking at the mirror, you're drawn to that rather than engaging with your listener or with your, per, your, your, your restaurant mate. So at best, we want to hide it so that we're connected to our listeners so we can free up some brain space to think about our content, but also so we can reduce those critical thoughts. Okay. I hope right. there's a comment from Christy here. Have you observed any changes to how we communicate in meetings slash presentations due to more frequent use of virtual meetings? And what tips do you have to be more effectively present yes. in a virtual environment yeah. in addition to hiding your self view? Great. Thank you, Jess and Christy. Uh, yeah, great question. So it's a little counterintuitive. So yes, hired yourself. You, we talked about that. It's a little counterintuitive that you need to really amp up your energy. And we do this for a few reasons. One is we are flat. We're sitting. We don't have all the 3D stimulation coming of seeing people in real life. So if you are presenting on Zoom to two people, you need to use the energy that you'd be presenting to four people. We need to double your energy. And that I'm sure to many of you sounds exhausting, especially if you are not a high energy person. But here is the good news. Well, one good news is that your listeners will be more apt to listen and engage, and that will make you feel more comfortable and more successful at communicating. But here's the counterintuitive piece. At the end of the Zooms, at the end of the day, when you've been presenting virtually and you double that energy, yes, you're tired, but you're actually less tired and more satisfied than you are when you're flatlining all day. So we wind up spiking that adrenaline and that gets us going, that, that makes the meeting more interesting for us and those around us. And at the end, it's that exhaustion of like, oh yeah, I just ran or I just finished something big. So you're tired, but it's a satisfied tired versus a, oh my God, I've been on Zoom all day and I'm tired, I'm bored to death. So try really upping the energy. If you can stand up, I'm, in a, uh, I'm, I'm not in my regular office right now, but if you can stand up, that can also help with your energy and help you to engage differently than when you're sitting all day long flatlining. Okay, um, how can you hide your self view? Okay, great. So if you hover over your image, there are three dots on the right, or if you look in participants and you see your name and you click on more, there's an option for hiding self view. Oh, and then she found it, sorry, <laughs> I'm just seeing it. Okay, oh, and people answered, okay, great, um, excellent. All right, so one of the things that we're also going to do is the reason why I'm starting with nerves is I'd love to have a volunteer for the next thing. So think about who wants to try this out. So we're coming up to in a minute, I'm just prepping you. The, the, the first thing I wanna do is think about you as a presenter or a communicator. So this is an eye chart. There's a lot of information here, but one of the things that we've probably all done at some point in our lives is done a Myers-Briggs or done an Enneagram or done something of that nature where we assess what our personality style is. This is a quadrant approach, which is a little simpler of how you communicate and work with others. And I'll summarize this in that there are those of you who the way you work is like an owl, top left, 
where you're detail oriented, you're analytical, you like um, accuracy and precision. Many people in data analytics are owls. They are, they want precise information. And so you communicate that way. You can, you tend to, I'm not saying you, I'm not, I'm not putting you in a box, but many people who are, uh, care about data, care about analysis, who communicate this way or, or work this way, will then communicate the whole story. They'll give all the options. They'll give all the things that they did. They'll give the background, which is great if you're communicating to other owls who also like that kind of information. I see Dory laughing. I'm thinking some of this might resonate with her. So if you are, however, communicating to the upper right, which is the eagle, who soars, who goes fast, who wants the bottom line, who wants the results, you might drive them crazy because they don't want to know all the pros and cons. They don't want to know all that you did. They, they're they sure they might care about risk or avoiding risk, but they don't need to know exactly how you got there. So that's one challenge you may have in communicating. Bottom right, peacocks, forget about it. They want, they want creativity. They want the vision. They want the big picture stories. So you and your data unless it's visualized, which I know you guys, you're all working on. Uh, if we're going through spreadsheets or, or numbers, you're going to drive a peacock crazy. They don't care at all about the details. Bottom left, this is meant to look like a dove. We're gonna work on the visual. To me, it looks a little bit pigeon-like, but it, it, eventually I'll, I'll, I'll tweak it to look more like a dove. But the bottom left is really around uh, the people part of it. So while they're also risk averse like uh, the owls, they wanna know is there consensus, is there team building? Okay, what does this mean? Why am I showing you this? I'm showing you this because if you see that you are predominantly in one or two of these communication work styles and you need to present to a wide range of people or to people who are outside of your communication or work style, you may need to adapt which does not mean that they are more important than you are, but it does mean if they're going to listen, if they're going to be influenced, if they're going to care, they do need it adapted. And regardless of which style you are, the next thing we'll do is talk about the structure. And this is where we're, I'm going to ask for some volunteers. So we'll look at structure because structure is very helpful for all the styles and especially for owls who can go really deep. So what we want to do is look at this very simple, but simple, but profound, or what I call often is common sense, but not common practice of how you can give an overview, how you can summarize, how you can share at a meeting without feeling overwhelmed by all the information and data that you might want to share. So we'd start with giving a, a real brief context setting or topic overview. Say, I want to share the analysis of uh, the, the different uh, sports management tools we've looked at or some version of whatever topic you're looking at. I wanna share the analysis of uh, what's happening with um, healthcare reimbursements. So we, we just set the stage of this, of healthcare reimbursements in 2022. All right, so what I'm going to do with healthcare reimbursements in 2022 is first tell you about how that compared to prior years, uh, what we saw in 2022, and what we'll expect to see in the future. So we name three categories. Now that we go and say, okay, so prior to 2022, this is what we saw with healthcare reimbursements. They were uh, higher than they are in 2022. 2022, we saw them at this level, which is X percentage of what it was uh, in 2021. And uh, 2023 and beyond, we're expecting to see further reductions in reimbursements. In summary, we have seen healthcare reimbursements decline over the years. And what that means is we need to do X, Y, and Z, or that's the information to share. Okay, so this is a great way of either opening up a larger presentation to give the high level overview of what's coming, the executive summary, if you will, or if you wanna uh, present in a meeting and you don't know exactly how or what to share, think about using this structure tool. You could use two bodies. It might be pros, cons. It might be, I'm gonna share the uh, results of my analysis. First, I'm gonna show, share with you the good things that we found and the difficult news. So as for the good, here's all the good things that we found in the analysis. Here are the challenges that emerged. 
in result, here's the summary. Uh, if somebody asks you a question that you're not expecting, it's a great way to pause and think, how am I going to categorize the answer and give a quick a summary of, let's say someone asked you your favorite place to take a vacation. And you might pause because you're like, well, I love vacation, but how do I, how do I categorize that so quickly? So I would say, well, I really love a beach vacation for three reasons. First, I love to go to the beach because it tends to be warm. I like to go to warm beaches, it tends to be warm. And that reminds me of my childhood growing up in Florida. The second reason I love a beach vacation is there's a lot to do. You can go on long walks. You can go swimming in the water. There tend to be some sports around. And three, I like a, a beach vacation because it, it makes me relax. I can bring a book. I can lie on a towel and really enjoy myself. So in summary, there's three great reasons why I love a beach vacation. All right, so that's what I'd love to have one of you agree. Oh, we're going too fast here. Oh, up, 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 up. Um, one of you do. Um, is there somebody who would like to practice either a work or non-work communication that you could give playing with this structure tool? You could do something like vacation, favorite flavors of ice cream, uh, the kind of pets that you like or what, what your favorite pet is and why. Or it could be something that you want to prepare for a real update that you have to give in the next week or two. Usually if I wait long enough, somebody will do it. Oh, David, thank you. All right. So I want to encourage people who are at this meeting to submit proposals to the DC student uh, area conference, okay? Uh, number one, it, it, when you go to the student conference, it's just a small, comfortable atmosphere with other students who are doing the same types of things that you're doing. Number two, you'll have all the help you need to prepare from your professor because you're probably gonna choose a topic from one of your classes. So you could like go back to your professor and say, you know, I wanna present this at the conference. Can you help me put together the presentation? And then number three, um, it's, it, since you're in this uh, um, you know, comfortable zone and you're, you're talking about uh, work that you already did for a class, it's gonna help you build comp, uh, confidence and, and get ready to do this on the larger stage sometime in the future. Uh, so in summary, gosh, I really want to encourage you guys uh, to submit proposals for this upcoming DC conference. The deadline is this Friday. <laughs> Beautiful, David. That was awesome. Excellent. Great. And a perfect quantification of the topics. Lovely. Uh, the key is this. Again, you know, David make it look, made it look simple. It's not so simple, especially when we are on the fly. If all of a sudden we hear there's an interesting conversation happening in a meeting and we want to, to contribute, but we're like, wow, I have this huge wealth of information. How do I distill it down into a digestible amount of content? So think about, can you categorize it in two or maybe three areas and do like David does, quantify, give a nice overview and a nice summary step. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Okay, so moving on from this, we've talked now about nerve strategies. We've talked about uh, how to adapt to different communication styles how to structure. Now we're gonna get into some of the, uh, I, won't, I don't wanna call it touchy-feely, but, but the idea of how we show up our presence virtually and in person. And one of the things that I like to think about is that whether you are a communicator or a leader is the goal is, and whether you are, I don't care if you are, I happen to choose two women for these images, but I don't care if you are non-binary, male, female, whatever your gender, whatever your or, or, um, identification is that everyone who wants to be effective at communication and having good presence should balance some strength and some warmth. And we'll talk about how to do this and then we'll dive in, or we'll talk about why this is important and then we'll dive into how to do it. So the reason why it's important is when we look at what we do is often you all are grad students. I have been a grad student before and often we value words. We value research. We focus a lot on um, analysis or numbers, and we might not focus as much on the vocal or the sound of our voice 
or the visual, how people see us. So um, there's an interesting and very uh, disputed research, similar to Amy Cuddy's Power Pose. I love it. I know from personal experience and from, uh, from my clients that that really works. This is similar to this study I'm about to tell you about the, the data, but um, there's a lot of good, it's been disputed, but there's some really good, important um, lessons in it. So if you would please get your fingers warmed up because I want to have you type into the chat. If you think about the words you say, the sound of your voice or how you look, if all three of those things make 100% of the image or the impression you're creating when you first start to talk, the initial impression, what percentage of that 100% do the words count for, the verbal? Is it 33%, which would be a third of the impression you're creating? Is it 100%? What percent do you think the words count? Okay, Aaron. Okay, uh, Susan. All right, Susan has 20, Aaron has seven, okay, Christy says 20. So, so far, anyone say higher than, okay, great. Okay, 50, so this is what I love, is right now we see as low as seven and as high as 50. All right, so Leslie, you were saying 50. And, and this research is based on something that Aaron has seen before because it is seven, uh, based on initial impressions. So for example, you're very unlikely to remember the first words I said when I first were ta was talking to you, but you right, might have gotten an impression about me by something other than my words from the initial thing I said. Now, over the course of the hour, you might have paid more attention to the words and those stand out. But the initial impressions are important because they can determine, are we gonna to listen to this person? Do we trust this person? Am I going to pay attention or am I going to look at Facebook or some other thing? So the impressions do matter. Okay, so the verbal is seven. Now let's say about the vocal, the sound of your voice. Actually, I'm not even gonna do it in there because this, this research is about in-person. It's 38% for how the voice sounds and 55% of the visual. Now this data is Moravian is the, um, is the um, researcher and it's, it's disputed because it's really about the initial impression you're creating. And I would further say that this is not these, these numbers are not accurate for our, our new virtual world. If we are in person, I do stand by this number, even if they're not to the exact number, I do stand by the idea that in person, the visual is the first thing we absorb and it does determine, am I going to listen to this person? Do I think they're credible? Do I care? Uh, virtually, the sound of the voice comes up higher. The vocal, I, uh, um, and I haven't seen um, updated research on this, though there should be some now because we've now been virtual long enough, but that the vocal counts more than it did from in-person or than it does in person. And the visual might come down a little bit more because we know a lot of people are not showing their screens. And so certainly when we're on a conference call, the, the vocal goes way up. Uh, and I believe in Zoom as well, because we're not able to see the whole body. The point of this is not whether these numbers are exactly right. The point of this is that most of us spend all of our time prepping the verbal. And we don't think about how we're showing up or how we sound. So when you are thinking about showing up at a meeting or showing up at a new job or talking to a client or whatever your work requires you or your personal life requires you to do, think about what you need to do visually and vocally this is not meant to intimidate you. And if it does, go back to those nerve strategies. Get curious. Get curious of, wow, if I double my energy like she, should, she suggested, how will that make them perceive me? I'll get curious about that. Or I'll flip my script. Or we'll hide our selfie. Now, sometimes we don't want to hide the selfie I saw because we want to remind to smile at the audience. You could also put a little sticky note to smile at the audience or a picture of something that makes you laugh like, a cat doing something dumb or whatever. Um, so there are other ways that you can remind yourself to smile, even if you, uh, if you don't wanna have your, your selfie on. Okay, so we brought this up so that we can think about the visual and the vocal. Now let's go back to strength. If you are a self-defined communicator who's on the warm side, the warm side is I'm, I'm, I prioritize connecting with others. That's really where my jam is in terms of connecting. 
This does not totally correlate to that last um, quadrant slide of the owl and the peacock and the eagle and the dove. This could be separate. Some of this could be in, um, introversion and extroversion. There's a whole bunch of dimensions as we know about style and personality. But if you know, if someone has told you you are a warmer communicator than a strong communicator, or you know from experience, these are ways of demonstrating your strength. Visually, having a square symmetrical body, especially when you're in person, or even on Zoom, if I'm presenting to you like this and telling you, well, the data looks like this, not going to be that great of a strong impression. Eye contact. So if we are asked a question and we need to think, or we're telling our data and we're explaining about it and we're in our head, but we're looking up to try to access it, we're not going to look strong nor connected to our listeners. Okay, make strong statements. Uh, we're going to do an exercise for this, really quick exercise. So the title of my book is Speak Up, Damn It. And the reason for that title is this exercise right now. So if you are a communicator who gives disclaimers, who gives apologies, or you are an owl who gives a lot of detail, a lot of information, and what you want to do is really make a concise statement, it can help to end your statement with the word damn it, in your head, and by slamming your fist on the table in front of you. So if you all would please uh, put, make a fist with your hand, and if you can with your other hand, unmute yourself, because I'd love to hear us all do this together. And what we're going to say is, uh, when I count down from three, when I get to one, all of us together will say, I am an, I am an effective communicator. Damn it. And then you're going to pound the fist. So three, two, one. I, I am an effective communicator. communicator. Damn it. Damn it. Okay. Thank you. All right. So that's very helpful too. If you wind up, if you notice that you are asking questions instead of making statements. So if you say we should review the data, we should look at the budget. Uh, making ending with that damn it is a great way of ending assertively. Again, this is more if you are on that warm side of the communication. If you're already strong, you probably have this down. Pausing is another great way of cultivating your strength, of showing I have control of the content, I have control of the visual, what you see, I'm calm, cool, and collected, even if I'm not feeling that way. Pauses can help with that. They help with making sure you're not over explaining, apologizing, disclaimers. And the last thing is around assertive language. So what this means is what we're going to the next one is around avoiding these the weak languages of the I might, I kind of, I think, I sort of think we should do this. I sort of think the data show this. Um, I think like it's my opinion, but I'm no expert. All of that is, is, is weak language we want to replace with assertive language. Okay, uh, let's see. What does Robert say? Advising interviewing students to get rid of up speak. Exactly, Robert. Exactly. If they can end and practice, I'm not saying to say this for real, but if they can practice by saying their statement of, uh, as an undergraduate, I would I did this kind of research. Damn it. I am looking to uh, do graduate studies to uh, learn this kind of these kind of skills. Damn it. This is how I will apply what I've learned in data by learning data analysis, damn it. So making statements, not up speak. Yes, pauses, Susan, absolutely. One of the mistakes people make is they think that they, they, they tell themselves, oh, I can't say, um, I can't say, um, I can't say sort of like whatever the words are. Uh, it's like when you, uh, when the, when the calendar turns to January 1, and you say, I can't eat candy or sugar or whatever it is that is your vice that you're trying to get rid of. And for many of us, what happens is we think about it more. It becomes a bigger deal. So if we think, I can't say, um, I can't say, um, don't say, um, don't say, um, oh my God, you said, um, you're, you're um, completely setting yourself up to failure. But if instead you're replacing it with something positive saying, oh, I'm going to pause more frequently. I'm going to pause after every statement. I'm going to pause within statements when I say, I have three things I want to share with you. First, da, 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 da. 
So incorporating the pauses, great way. Or we're scared of silence. Yes, Robert. Uh, there's a fun exercise I do called five items where we sit in silence. All right, actually, let's do it. I'm gonna stop sharing. Do I have a volunteer? I'll do it. I'll be the one doing it. So you don't have to do much. If I have one volunteer that, I, that we can pin. Anyone, anyone, it's, it will be, okay, thank you, Dory. Okay, so I'm going to pin you, Dory. And uh, will you give me a category of anything in the world? This could be a cat, like names of five types of ice cream or five uh, states in the United States that touch the Atlantic Ocean or five uh, movie stars, whatever, any category of, uh, that had, contains at least five things. Right now? Right now, please. Flowers. Daisies, tulips, roses, hibiscus, daffodils. Daffodils, thank you. It is so much harder than it looks. So all of you all had flowers, but when you're on the spot like that, it's really hard. So the idea of this exercise is you hold eye contact with someone while you think and you get comfortable with the silence. I'm telling you, it looks easy. Every time, if I looked away, if I wrote down, I'm sure I could come up with a million flowers, but I'm on this spot. I've got how many eyes looking at me? That's nerve wracking. So that is one of the best ways of being able to practice sitting in silence. Thank you, Dory. So I highly recommend you all do that. You can do that with your roommates, with your family members, with your teammates, whatever it is. It's a great exercise. It's called five items. And, and you just hold eye contact. You pause between answers. And you don't say a word or look anywhere but at their eyes until you can come up with the five. If they say it really easily, they just rattle them off, then ask them for three more. The idea is to get them to the place where they have to think without looking away and sitting in silence. Okay, great. So let's go back to our slides. Let's look about warmth. So maybe some of you feel like you're really strong communicators or you've been told you're, so, oh gosh, why did I keep messing up? Um, you, you are, I didn't say I'm sorry. I just said, gosh, I keep messing up. I, I stated it. I tried not to say sorry. Okay, so warmth. If we want to, if we know that we are really strong communicators and we need to cultivate warmth, here are some good strategies visually leaning in. Again, if I'm on the call and someone tells me, yeah, you look disengaged or you're intimidating on the call or you look disinterested, lean forward, engage, show you care in person or virtually. Okay, mirroring behavior sounds a little creepy like single white female, but there's all kinds of fantastic research on if we can adapt to the style of our listeners they're more likely to listen to us, to, to, um, to uh, connect with us. So that could be in the, in the vocal tone, that can be in the visual. If they have tons of energy and are using gestures and we start to use more gestures, we're going to be more aligned. If they're talking softly and they're very caring in their tone and we mirror that, we are more likely to be aligned. The reality is we're doing it anyway. Subconsciously, we're mirroring. Uh, when I used to do all-day workshops with people in person, we would do a fun exercise where I'd have everyone pair up. I, I would not have, have shown this slide yet, uh, but I'd have everyone pair up and talk about their weekend, you know, past weekend, upcoming weekend, whichever. And then I would tell everyone to freeze after about a minute and a half. And it was uncanny to see how many people were, were perfect mirror images of each other hand on the hip, arm out, crazy, you know, leaning to the side. We naturally do it. And if you are told that you are, you are too um, strong, I am, I am all for a clear, assertive, strong communicator. But if it's to the point that it's alienating people, consider are you paying attention to your listeners and can you bridge the differences between them physically? Smile. Okay, I actually don't like the word smile on here. I like more, but the, 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 the phrase I, I say instead sounds a little weird, softening your face. So there are more women than men on this call. And the last thing I would ever do is to tell any group of people, but particularly women, oh, smile. Uh, that feels condescending and outdated and old fashioned and a lot of other gendered problems with that. 
But if you're told that you are being assertive or aggressive to the point of not being likable or credible or, um, or working well with someone, think about, are you grimacing? Are you giving some kind of look that makes it seem that you are intense and not caring about the situation? If so, soften your face. So don't necessarily smile or fake smile, but soften your face so that you're engaged. Okay. Eye contact is on both of these, right? The eye contact is so that we are directly telling our content without looking up at the sky and not looking credible, but also holding eye contact so I'm caring. I'm paying attention to the signals. I'm paying attention to how you're receiving the information and how I should um, adjust. Maybe you're looking confused, so I need to give more context or ask a question, or maybe I'm talking too much and you all need to talk. Okay. Um, and then including benefits verbally, including the benefits to them. Verbally on the strong was being assertive, using strong, clear language. Verbally on the warm is including benefits to the room, to the team, to them. Okay, Pamela, when you get to a certain age, smiling keeps you approachable looking and looking younger. Okay, I'm not going to talk about ageism, but yes, excellent. Uh, okay, so we've covered a ton of things and I've done all the talking. So what I'd love to do is, first of all, invite you to connect with me. We're not done. I want to answer some questions, but invite you to connect with me on LinkedIn, both because I share some um, relevant content and also because if you have questions and you forget how to find me or to email me, I am always happy to answer messages on LinkedIn around your questions that arise and support what you're doing. I, I want to know what you're doing in your work and your career. So it's really interesting for me to see uh, who, who's on here and what you're doing. You can also email me or go to the website. So let's now talk to you. What, what's on your mind? Uh, let's stop sharing here. Okay, what are your questions? Anyone? Can we ask questions live right now? Or Absolutely. did you move in the chat? Please, live? that'd be great. Okay, um, so I'm really glad to have the opportunity to be at this today because I've been doing a lot of interviews lately and I have one in a few hours. So <laughs> I'm hoping to implement some of these things in that interview. And one of the main challenges for me in interviews is that I'm more of an introvert and an internal processor. Mm -hmm. And I have a hard time, unless I've already thought about this question before and really have an answer ready, if somebody throws me an unexpected question, it's so hard for me to think about it on the spot mm -hmm. like that. And sometimes I'm just blank mm -hmm. and I don't feel like I can pause for too long. Like I need to say something to respond to that question. And I'm wondering if you have any advice for responding when you need to say something and you don't really know, like you would need time to think about that to really get an answer, but you need to say something. Yes, I love this question. It's so relevant for so many of us. One of the issues I had with flowers, there are so many flowers in the world that I couldn't narrow it down because there were so many flowers that I got stuck. My mind went blank trying to think of, I should know this. I know this flowers. I mean, I love flowers. I, I mean, I, I have flowers in my yard. What fly? I mean, I just couldn't think because it was too wide of an expanse of information for me to narrow down. So categorizing is key. Going back to that structure tool. So for example, if they ask a question, a couple of things you could do is first of all, have the self-talk, the faith that I, you have an answer. You can come up with an answer. And especially if you help yourself out by categorizing. So no, like I, I can come up with an answer. It might not be a complete answer or the perfect answer I want, but give yourself that affirmation of like, I know I can come up with an answer. And I know I can do this with grace. I can know I can, I can save face. So if they ask you a question, pause, you could say, I need a moment to think about that. And you can categorize. And so think, how can I make this smaller? How can I come up with a way of, you know, it could be, a, could it be a pro con situation? Or if they said, and if you, we can do this now, Dory, and you, you do not have to do it, but I think it would be interesting if we've tried and you could absolutely back out. But if I said, Dory, tell me about, uh, tell me about uh, a, a experience in your career that challenged you. See if you can give me a statement that gives you time to think 
and see if you can also categorize. You can think about experiences of were there these experiences in my early career? Were these experiences in the most recent thing I was doing? Can I come up with making the answer smaller so that I can, I, I just come up with, the, with the field smaller so that I can actually come up with some content that feels worthy of talking? Mm -hmm. So do you have an answer to that? Or what would you say if that came up? Sure. I mean, that's one that I actually do feel ready to respond to. So it wasn't as hard. I wasn't a deer in the headlights on that one. Um, I kind of have my arsenal of things that I know I they're they're like ready to grab and use. And it's when someone asks me a question that's outside where none of those apply that I kind of can can get stuck. So that one was easy for me. Yes. I won't take time answering it and take right. up everyone's time on that. Perfect. And that's it, is that uh, I didn't want to give one so out of left field that was be panicking you before this, this <laughs> interview. But the idea is, can you in general? A lot of times our nerves get to a place where we go blank. I know five flowers. I went fully blank with all of you in that call and that just now. If we could categorize. Okay, so... Um, the question is something I don't know. Let me think about how would I look at it from the frame of this and, or from the frame of this, just making the field smaller. Mm -hmm. um, anyone have any other tips for Dory? Or, and you know, how do you save face? How do you take time? How do you process without uh, losing faith? Yes, Susan. Um, I put something in the chat. It, this is not so much for interviews, but when you're doing public speaking, um, you don't always have to answer the question that they ask. Um, when I've been in situations where I've gotten a question out of left field that, you know, either is something I, I'm not allowed to talk about, you know, in terms of U.S. foreign policy or something like that, I, I come prepared or came prepared, I'm retired, um, with, you know, what, what did I want to get out of that event or that speech? And I would go back to that. I'd say, you know, well, you know, I can't talk about that, but you know, we're here today to talk about this, or even, I mean, that's pretty blunt, but you could do it, you know, less bluntly and use it to your advantage to get your point across, whatever, you know, I, I suppose you could do it, you know, Dory, you could do it, um, you know, if there's something that is not a common thing that you might be asked about, but you want to make sure you get that out in the interview to tee that up. I don't know, just a suggestion. Susan, that's great. It's uh, Have you been media trained before? Yeah. Okay, yeah. So, so bridging is classic bridging where we come up with our, you know, our, our key messages and then whatever question is asked of us, we say, that's a really interesting question. I'd love to get back to you on that. Uh, but the thing that I think is most important about my qualifications are da, 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 or an experience that highlights my qualifications are da, 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 da. So that could be a, a less abrupt way of doing it. And so you're still valuing the question and, and acknowledging, I, you know, I'll, I'll think about that some more. In the meantime, let me share another experience I've had that is relevant to this, this opportunity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for that, Susan. Um, what other questions do you all have? I have one. Um, do you have any tips for pacing? One of my biggest problems is I just talk really fast, whether I'm interviewing or presenting. And sometimes I'll put a post-it that says slow down, but if I forget or if I'm just not looking at it, I just kind of just go. Yes. Okay. Often when we get excited or nervous, our adrenaline spikes. So silly things that are true are... Uh, uh, making sure you're not drinking too much caffeine, but, you know, even if you are a big caffeinated person, sometimes we're nervous and so we're drinking even more caffeine and then it creates a bigger problem. Mm -hmm. uh, here's another thing, and I wish I had it nearby, but uh, anyone have a piece of paper nearby that they can crumple up into a ball or, or a ball? Do you have a squeeze ball? Anyone have a ball close by, a tennis ball, a squeeze ball, a stress ball? Okay, look, Dory's ball. All right, great. Okay, so Dory has, Dory has a ball now, it's a paper ball. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that we do when we talk too fast is it's really hard for us to remember to pause or slow down or slow down is relative. What does that mean? We don't, you know, we're, we're in our head now. So one great thing we can do is have a ball nearby or an object, but a ball is really nice, even if it's a paper ball and say a sentence and then outside of the camera view, toss it or hand the ball over to the other hand in, uh, before you say the next sentence. So that will represent your pause. 
So you might say, it's important that we talk about foreign policy and here are three things I wanna cover. Okay, first, let's talk about what's happening in Russia. Next, I wanna talk about what's happening in Afghanistan. And finally, we're gonna talk about global uh, peace at large. Whatever. All right. So the idea is that you you pa pass the ball. Tossing is possible. I am not great at doing that. And then we can worry, oh, I dropped the ball. So even if just a, a handoff, but thinking about doing that, when we do something physical, we're much more likely to remember to do it because otherwise it's in our head. It's one more piece of shoulds that's in our head that's polluting all of our thinking. This is this is somatic, it's physical. And it does require practice. Now, Dory may want to do it today, but I would say, Leslie, if you have something big coming up, you, you want to practice it before you just do it in the first call. Uh, and you, you do want to keep it out of the camera view. Okay. It's something we couldn't really do easily when we were in person. What I would say in person is if you have a few people, let's say you have three people around a room, is you hold eye contact with one of those people while you're saying one sentence you insert a pause, you find the second person, you say your second sentence, you pause, you connect with the third person to say your third sentence, pause. So that's the way that we used to do it live. The mm -hmm. physical is even easier to do it if you practice and, and remember to do it in the, in the moment when you speak fast. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? Uh, also, Pamela, yeah, remember to relax. Yes, no, don't know. Yes. Um, I have a question. Great. So, um, you know, when you give a presentation to a group, you want to make sure you get all your ideas across. Uh, you don't want to sound scripted. You want to sound natural. But, you know, and, and the typical guidance is, well, write notes, you know, write notes, talk to the notes. I mean, do you have any guidance uh, beyond that to um, give me as a speaker the confidence that I'm going to convey the ideas I want to while not sounding scripted. Yes, I am absolutely adamant that you do that no one here ever writes a script. So we can say notes and I've seen you I've seen your notes and I'm not saying literally I've seen your notes, but I've seen enough notes that I know notes look a lot like a script most of the time. So what I would say is um, making something more interesting like that structure tool. I'm happy if you want to email me, any of you want to email me, I have a slightly more detailed version of that structure tool that I can send as a PowerPoint and you can put bullets and keywords in there. And then you have all of your information on one piece of paper with bullets. And visually, it's much easier to remember because like, right, I start, I just need to set the context where I need to say a little bit about each of the areas I'm going to cover. Um, within the bodies of information, I might even be able to stratify it. If it's like an hour long talk, I might be able to stratify it into three different areas of each of the bodies. And then I go through each of the bodies of information. I summarize each of those areas and then I give the next steps or um, key takeaway. So key bu bullets, keywords, and having some version of an interesting structure versus just all the words on a paper so that you can look down quickly and know where you are and come back uh, to, the, to the listeners. Okay. I need to get ready to um, head off to a second uh, workshop. So I am so happy to see you all. And I know that there, well, uh, there may be additional questions. So if there are, please do reach out to me by LinkedIn or by email. I'm more than happy to get them to you. If you want the more detailed structure tool, uh, message me as well. And really appreciated your interaction, your questions, uh, your engagement today. Hope, thank you so very much. It was awesome. And I have Hope Spoke and I've read Hope Spoke and I know how hard she worked on the audio book. And so um, I will say if anyone wants to, uh, you know, a light, um, interesting um, audio book in the car, it's really great. So you're the best hope. Thanks. And thanks everybody for being here today. And, and, um, that's it. I, there are some more, uh, workshops coming up, um, which have been shared with you. Um, uh, what's the next one, Bev? Friday on, uh, preparing your proposal for the American Evaluation Association conference. 
which is actually also probably helpful for David's conference that he was plugging earlier in the uh, presentation today. Awesome. Great. All right, everybody. Uh, keep working hard in your classes or your jobs or your life or whatever you're doing. Thank you for being here. And uh, we'll see you at the next one. Thanks, everybody. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much.